Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday YouTube channel. I am your host, Ryan Hartley. This channel is for heart-centered leaders just like you. I hope our time spent together helps you leave a heart print where those around you are left better than yesterday. These interview sessions are sponsored by our great friends at Elevate Online Marketing. On episode 205, I'm joined by Chris Walk. Chris is a young adult cancer survivor. He's a best-selling author and patient advocate. Chris was diagnosed with a stage three colon cancer in 2003 at just 26 years old. After surgery, Chris made the decision to go against his doctor's advice and opted out of chemotherapy and chose to use nutrition and natural therapies to heal. Six years later, in 2010, Chris began sharing his story of faith, courage and determination and his message of hope that chronic diseases like cancer can be prevented and reversed with a radical transformation of diet and lifestyle. In the last decade, Chris has become one of the most well-known cancer survivors on the planet and reaches millions of people a year as a blogger, podcaster, speaker, and global health coach through his books, his social media, and his website, chrisbeatcancer.com. This conversation over the next hour and a half is barely going to scratch the surface of what is possible. I highly recommend you head to chrisbeatcancer.com, find out more about him, his story, consume his blogs, listen to his podcast, watch his interviews on, on YouTube with other survivors, and be sure to read his books. Chris Beat Cancer, he also has a, a 365 days of, of inspiration, encouragement, and action steps to survive and thrive. And his third book, which is Beat Cancer in the Kitchen, deliciously simple plant-based anti-cancer recipes. There's an abundance of information that should empower you and those that you love. I hope that you enjoy this conversation. I hope that you lean into the curiosity and the possibilities of Chris's story and may it fuel you with hope and leave you and the ones that you love slightly better than yesterday. Here we go, episode 205 with Chris Walk. Chris, welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast. How are you? I am well, thank you. Oh, thank How you are so you? much. Yeah, I'm great. Thank you for taking time out of your day. And um, I think with a book called chris beat cancer it's quite possibly the biggest spoiler alert to put at the at the start of a podcast <laughs> but I'd, I'd love to i'd love for you to take us back to this kid destined for greatness take us back to this <laughs> this period of your that, life thank you that that's very flattering um so i yeah the spoiler is i didn't die um Good. but uh i was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer at 26. So I was technically an adult, didn't quite feel like an adult, you know, like in your 20s, you kind of still feel like a, you're not really a grown up. <laughs> at an epic handlebar. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I was a, two years out of college. I was a newlywed. That's kind of adult stuff, you know, and I had started my own business and I was playing in bands and and like really loving my life. I mean, things, my life was just, things were going great. I mean, and um, I was really excited about the future and I had, you know, I was ambitious and uh, I had big dreams and goals and I was trying to achieve stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was hustling, man. I was, I was really trying to make stuff happen. And, and but I started getting these abdominal pains in uh, early um, 2003. And uh, I was just working really hard and really busy. And I, I just they would come in these pains would come and go. And I just didn't worry about it. I wasn't taking any anything for the pain. It would just it were just little random twinges. You know, it wasn't like debilitating at all. <clears throat> and um, and I didn't go to the doctor or anything. And then over the course of the year, uh, toward the end of the year, like once, you know, we got into November, the pain really started to get worse. And that's when I was like, okay, 
I got to see a doctor like, mm, mm. and, um, I got referred around, but eventually I had a colonoscopy and they found a golf ball sized tumor in my large intestine and sent it to the lab and biopsied it and said, you have colon cancer. And they wanted me to, to have surgery just immediately. And this was just a couple of days before Christmas. So it was like a whirlwind mm. and, um, a lot of cancer patients really have the same story. You know, you get this diagnosis and then you're just rushed into treatment before you understand anything about the disease or the treatment or what to expect, what's happening to you. I mean, it's just, it's just a, an urgency, uh, what's maybe called tyranny of the urgent. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in a state of fear and panic and worry, you can't really make a good decision. You can't think rationally and logically. You are at the mercy of your sort of base survival instincts, which are not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're can help you run away, you know, yeah. from a, from a scary situation, right. Or fight for your life. Um, but in terms of making like a really wise decision about your health care, uh, you can't do that in a state of fear. And so anyway, I was, um, you know, rushed into surgery and, and I basically, I was able to postpone it. And it wasn't because I was smart. I was, <laughs> my mm. reasoning was, I don't want to be in the hospital during Christmas. Mm. You know, it's like, to me, it's like, can I just have a Christmas with my family, like a normal kind of Christmas? And they're like, yeah. So I, I went in for surgery on December 30th mm. and they took out a third of my large intestine and that's where the tumor was and a bunch of lymph nodes. And when I woke up, they said, you're stage three, which is worse than we thought. If you're stage two with colon cancer, they can remove the tumor and then send you home and you're done. At least that was, that was the standard, mm -hmm. uh, standard of care back then. And, uh, but stage three means you need chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was told that I would need nine to 12 months of chemotherapy. So, you know, <laughs> Man, a cancer diagnosis is like, it's a traumatic life event, oh. right? It's basically like someone's telling you, you're dying, Yeah. right? You have a life-threatening, potentially deadly disease, and uh, we don't know how long you have to, to live. And I mean, so you're, you're, your whole life just sort of comes to a grinding halt. Hmm. And, um, and it's really scary. And no one understands like no one can understand what you're going through unless it's another cancer patient. Like no one else really has any mm. idea mm. what the, what that feels like. And, um, it's just a lot to process. And so I was dealing with all that, of course, in just this two week span yeah. <clears throat> spent Christmas with my family. And it was of course really weird. And like the elephant in the room, you know, everybody knew I had cancer, but mm. it was like, nobody knew what to say and I don't even know what to say about it. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's like, uh, yeah. Uh, so two things happened in the hospital that I talk about in my book. One was the very first meal that they served me after taking out a third of my large intestine was a sloppy Joe. Do you know what a sloppy Joe is? Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. I do. They have sloppy joes where you live. <laughs> I was reading. I was reading in your book. There, there's some. It's uh, it's safe for schools and prisons or something. Like that. <laughs> yes, sloppy joes. I I don't know if sloppy joes just an American thing or if they serve them in other countries. But yeah, it's it's like it's almost like spaghetti sauce. It's like ground beef mm. in a in a giant stew pot, and they ladle it onto a burger bun. Yeah. For anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about. And it's it's like really only served at summer camp or in, in the military or in, in prison. You know, it's like that's kind of like <laughs> where they're serving sloppy joes. But anyway, apparently, surprise, they serve them in hospitals too wow. uh, to sick people, cancer patients, heart disease. Like, doesn't matter. Like, if sloppy joes on the menu, everybody's getting one. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so that was a, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, because I, I knew what healthy food looked like. Like I knew if they walked in with, yeah. a, with a salad or a bunch of vegetables and said, you need to eat this, I would have been like, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, yeah, yeah. it's healthy. If I must, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, so that, that got the wheels turning a little bit. And then the, 
and then the next thing that happened was the day they told me I could go home, my surgeon came in and we were having a conversation and I just happened to say, Hey, is there any food I need to avoid? Yeah. Because everything you eat is going down the tube, right? Yeah. Yep. Mouth to yep. anus. It's all one long tube and your yep. colon is the end of the line. So like, I didn't want to eat the wrong thing and, and mm. somehow screw up the stitches or, you know, I don't know, rupture my colon or something. Mm. Um, you know, and uh, you can imagine there's all kinds of foods that sound like they might be a problem. But my surgeon said, no, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that, that was that was the advice. Wow. Uh, and I mean, you know, again, I'm like, well, why is there such a huge disconnect between healthcare? the healthcare industry and just like basic healthy Health. food, healthy living advice. Like I had been around healthy health nut people. I worked in a natural mm -hmm. food grocery store called wild oats mm -hmm. in college. So like I, I knew what wheatgrass was, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I, uh, I, by the way, I wasn't eating that way for sure. I was eating a standard American diet, which is tons mm -hmm. of fast food, processed food, junk food, meat and dairy, sugar salt and oil i mean just yeah. i was just consuming the same food everybody else eats yeah in a rich western nation yeah and uh so i get home i'm recovering from surgery i'm trying to you know i wean myself off the pain medication and uh i as i sobered up i just realized like i don't really want to do chemotherapy you know, I just had this re resistance to it because I knew it was really poisonous. It was highly toxic. Uh, I had seen advanced chemo patients out there in the world. And, and I call them advanced chemo patients because people tend to associate what chemotherapy does to someone as cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's not cancer that makes them look that way. It's the mm -hmm. drugs. It's the chemotherapy mm -hmm. drugs. And I'd seen that I like, can, and, and you know, it leaves an impression on you when you see another human in that just emaciated yellow skin, no hair, you know, dark eyes. I mean, just, you just, just think, oh my gosh, I could, mm. I can't believe this person is in this physical state. You know, it's, you know, the only thing I can, could liken it to, it's like when you see those concentration camp mm. you know, images, it's like, so not that bad, but it's, you know, in some cases mm. it's close. And um, so I thought, man, that's going to be me. Mm. And I was already really thin. I was already very, I'd lost a lot of weight. I've always been thin anyway, and I'm 6'2", and I'm, I'd lost a lot of weight. And uh, I was just like, I can't, I don't think I can handle chemotherapy, like physically. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't know what to do. And I just prayed about it. And I was like, God, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me. I, I don't know what to do. I need help. Mm -hmm. And I, it was just a simple prayer of desperation, but also of faith. Like I was believing, you know, that yeah. God would answer my prayer. So I'm yeah. a Christian. I just believe that, you know, that he really does yep. care and um, that he works all things for our good, which that's Romans 8, 28. Yep. And so two days later, I got a book that was sent to me from a man who knew my dad. Mm. who lived in Alaska. And that book was written by George Malcolmus. And he, and George Malcolmus, his story was he had colon cancer in the back in the 1970s and healed it with the raw food diet and juicing. Mm. <laughs> and so I start reading his story and I'm like, oh my gosh, colon cancer. That's what I have. Raw foods, juicing, like what's this about? Mm. You know? And um, so I got really excited. I was like, man, if this guy was able to heal naturally with nutrition, you mm. know, maybe I can heal. Mm -hmm. And it gave me so much hope. I was, I mean, it was just, it was just like an IV of hope yeah. <laughs> in the arm. Hey, my friends, thank you for being with us so far. I hope you're enjoying the interview. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about our signature heart print coaching. Our heart print coaching is for you. If you're ready to go all in on becoming a heart centered leader, ready to go all in on doing more of what you love, ready to see what you are capable of with support, guidance and accountability. You're ready to go on a rapid transformational journey that will change your life and others in as little as three months. Are you ready to show up with courage and share your gift with the world? 
ready to start making an income and more impact by doing what you love. Ready to start leaving your legacy where those around you are left better than yesterday. In our Heartprint Signature Coaching, in our time together, I'll help you lead from your heart set. I'll help you develop other people and your team. I'll help you bring your heart work to the world. I'll help you start leaving a legacy and capturing examples of your impact. I will help you be someone you love, to do more of what you love, and to serve people that you love. It's an amazing opportunity for someone who's ready to go all in and be a heart-centered leader. I'll throw in loads of other bonuses, including your life languages profile, uh, access to our Master Heart and Mind membership, and even some Always Better Than Yesterday merchandise. Head to abty.co.uk forward slash coaching to find out more, and I look forward to connecting with you very soon. That's abty.co.uk forward slash coaching. Here we go. Back to the interview. Yeah, which I imagine didn't last long because then you go and tell people about your crazy idea. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Yeah. So what happened was I, you know, I started reading his book and immediately I was like, I'm doing this. Mm. You know, I had no doubt. I was like, I prayed. I asked for something. This showed up. This is what I'm going to do. Like, I just knew this is the answer to my prayer. I've got to do this. And it, and it, it made sense to me. I, you know, he made a pretty good case in, in his book that uh, the reason we have so much chronic disease, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, uh, autoimmune disease, is largely because of our diet, lifestyle, and yeah. environment. Yeah. And by the way, I didn't know this at the time, but they've done a lot of studies on this kind of thing. And up to 90% of cancers are caused by diet, mm. lifestyle, mm. and environment. Mm. Like only five to 10% are genetic. And some people would argue it's like even less than that. Mm. So once the, once the light bulb went off and I realized I have a part to play in my life and in my health, and I'm not just a victim of disease, which is what mm. most cancer patients are told. Yeah. Like you're, it's either bad luck or bad genes. You're a victim. You didn't do anything wrong. You don't need to change your diet. You don't need to change anything. You just need to be comfortable and enjoy your life and eat your favorite foods after chemo. You just go home and have milkshakes and pizza Mm. and ice cream and all those yummy foods you love. You know, this is what they're told. I'm not exaggerating. (laughs) This is exactly what cancer patients are told to do. And, uh, and they're, they're disempowered. Um, unfortunately, by the medical system and their doctors. And, and so, um, and I was very much in that state and this kind of woke me up and I realized, no, I, I need to take responsibility for my life and my health yeah. and I need to change my life and I'm going to do everything in my power to help myself. And so mm-hmm. overnight, I changed my diet. Like there wasn't de- any deliberation. It was like, I'm doing this. I went to Whole Foods the next day. I loaded up the cart with vegetables. I bought a juicer mm-hmm. and I was, I was on my way. Like, okay, here we go. Let's figure this thing out. Like, yeah. So I was excited about that, but, but you're right. As I started to tell the people around me about it, <laughs> they were less enthusiastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My mom was a big supporter because she'd always been sort of a health junkie. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and had, she had a ton of books on juicing and healing. And like, it turns out I had a library that was like perfect for me in, in that moment of my life. Like it was divine how how many resources she had for me and she'd never been sick. You know, she just always been interested in health and natural healing. And so, yeah, there was a lot of pressure to do chemotherapy and I went to go see an oncologist and the appointment didn't go well and he just treated us badly. And I talk about the details in my book more, but I mean, the gist of it is I was just treated like every other patient, you know, just kind of like, Oh, here's another cancer patient. Here's, you got to do chemo. If you don't do chemo, you're going to die. You know, and he basically, as, as if stated, like a matter of fact. Yes. Oh, yeah. Very matter of fact. Absolutely. Just sort of dispassionate. Just you know, this is your only option. Mm. And uh, and he convinced me. By the way, yeah, I, I mean, his he he coerced me out of fear and fear, mm. some fear and intimidation to to sign up for chemo. And I and I made an appointment to get a port put in. In you know, a few weeks later. Um, but it was just a dreadful appointment. I mean, it was, it was so discouraging. And, and I just left there 
complete, just really hopeless. Yeah. And I went into that appointment really feeling good. I'd been on a raw food diet for a week. I was feeling energetic and optimistic and man, I mean, the cancer clinics can just be this, a lot of them are just a fear factory. Yeah. And like I said earlier, you can't make a good decision when you're in a state of fear. And that's how patients are coerced into, into treatment. And it's not like doctors are bad people, but that's, this is how they make their living. And they, they've been indoctrinated and trained and conditioned and told and led to believe that drugs are the only option. Yeah. Like it's if, that if a patient doesn't do these drugs, they're definitely going to die of cancer. And if they do the drugs, maybe they'll live longer, mm. um, but will probably still die of cancer. Mm. Um, or in some cases they'll, you know, have endless rounds of chemo and then just die mm. because their bodies are so wrecked. Now, there's no cancer in there, but their organs are just destroyed. And this is not uncommon. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to come across as the guy who, who like hates doctors because I have a lot of friends who are doctors mm -hmm. and, uh, it, but I really, part of my mission now as a survivor and a patient advocate is just to educate people. And so they understand like the way the cancer industry and the medical industry work, right? Yeah. It, this is, these industries are, are driven by profits yeah. and the most profitable therapies always win like that. They, they rise to the top. And so the least profitable therapies uh, are neglected mm -hmm. and that would be nutrition, <laughs> exercise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, stress reduction, forgiveness yeah. Yeah. you know yeah. all these the holistic we call holistic health yeah. approach to healing uh that has been abandoned yeah. by conventional medicine it used to be a part of it uh, and so anyway i'm I, i'm so thankful i'm just really thankful that i had three weeks or ish b before i was going to start chemo because i just went home and fired up the juicer and just kept doing what I was doing, you know? And yeah, and there was this looming, there was this date like looming. It was like mm. every day I was getting closer and closer to it and the anxiety was increasing. And then finally the day came to go get the port put in and I was just like, you know what, I'm not doing it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm gonna choose to live or die on my own terms. Mm. And that was uh, a hard decision because I also realized if, if I go this way, if I continue to go this way, I'm going alone. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't fault anyone around me. My mom supported me again, like I said, uh, and my dad did too, but he was sort of a silent, you know, he wasn't an enthusiastic supporter, but he, he mm. supported me mm. in, in a quiet, you know, way. He didn't oppose me or try to talk me out of it, but there's a lot of other family members that, that had a hard time with my decision and were trying to talk me out of it. And I just realized I had to be okay with, being misunderstood <laughs> yeah, yeah. and being alone and with people thinking I was a fool. Yeah. That's pretty hard. Like it's pretty hard to do something knowing everybody thinks you're an idiot. Well, I, I, and I've, I've read your account and, you know, talking about being acutely aware of your own mortality during this time as well. You know, that, that cold sweat of anxiety when you remember that you, you know, you had cancer within your body, it's, I can only imagine, you know, I guess that's not what it means to like walk on water, isn't it? To to step out the boat and walk on water and, and uh, a real leap of faith. Yeah. Yeah. The fear is a real, real, it's a daily struggle. And there are these moments, there are these like, when you're right in the thick of cancer and I, I you know, a, a lot of your listeners probably haven't had cancer, but you can almost liken it to a bad breakup. Sure. You know, like when you, there are moments throughout the day where you're just busy and you're distracted, right? And you're yeah. focused on something else. And then you're reminded yeah. that you have cancer or you're reminded that someone just broke your heart, mm. right? And that feeling, just the wave just washes over you and it's just awful, you know? It's mm. an awful feeling. Well, if you've been dumped, it's like grief, <laughs> you mm. know? Mm. You know, with cancer, it's fear, right? But these are very negative and unpleasant emotional states. So yeah, I had to learn how to give my fear to God. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I just, every day when, when the fear would come, I would just have to stop right in the middle of it and be like, okay, God, I trust you. 
Mm. Like I'm giving you my fear. I am just going to lay it down, right? I trust you. Just show me what I need to change in my life. And so I just kept asking for that. You know, show me what I need to do. Show me what I need to change. I trust you. I'm giving you my fear. I'm not going to be afraid. And that's the thing, like fear, fear is a feeling, right? We all have it uh, from time to time in life. And courage is the decision to move forward in spite of your fear. Courage isn't being fearless, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, it isn't fearless. Bravery isn't fearless. It's moving forward while you're afraid. You know, think of it in the battlefield analogy is the obvious one, right? It's scary. You could die, but you either press forward or you run away. And so I had to learn to do that, you know, and just, and just be, accept that I could control a lot of things in my life and then and that i couldn't control other things and trust god with the rest Mm, (laughs) you know mm. and so i just created a simple routine every day you know just my healing routine which was the food that i ate my you know uh my prayer life my thought life and just keeping staying as low stress as possible Mm -hmm. and uh, and and then repeat you know and just creating this what i call healing momentum yeah. where you're just you're just continually pumping your body full of anti-cancer nutrition mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. the first start and then just in gradually bit by bit changing the rest of your life because mm. changing your diet's the easiest part right that's like the gateway drug to total life change like it starts with what you eat yeah. <laughs> you know? and it was uh, 64 ounces of carrot juice a day yeah 64 ounces of carrot juice so it adds half a gallon. And then that, that kind of evolved into a blend of carrot, beet, celery, ginger. Root. So I started adding yeah. more to it as I learned more. But it started with the straight carrot juice and I did some juice fasting. And then I figured out, well, I need to eat a ton of vegetables. Mm. I, obviously, I, I eliminated all animal food and processed food, junk food. And I was like, I need to eat a ton of vegetables. And uh, like I got some raw food recipes, but it, it was just complicated and time consuming. And I was trying to figure out how to do it. And I just realized like, I just need to make a giant salad. Just put all these veggies in a bowl, just a big bowl. So it was like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, onions, mushrooms, peppers, sprouts, you know, garbanzo beans, lentils, I'm sprouting like uh, different legumes. Um, I'm putting olive oil and apple cider vinegar as a vinaigrette dressing. And then I'm like, well, I'm learning about all these spices that are anti-cancer mm-hmm. garlic and cayenne pepper and turmeric. I'm like, well, I can put those on the salad too. So I'm just like, you know, nutritional yeast, <laughs> like mm-hmm. you name it, man. I'm just like loading this thing up. It turns out it was like amazing. It was delicious, like so much flavor. And, um, and so I was like, man, this is really good. Like I could, I could eat this every day. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, well, if I could eat this, every day for lunch and dinner every day and i just realized like this is the way this is how i'm going to overdose on Mm -hmm. nutrition with juices all day two giant salads i usually juiced through through breakfast i didn't really eat breakfast i would just juice in the morning and maybe have some fresh fruit Mm mid-morning like you know green apple or grapefruit or something giant salad for lunch more juices in the afternoon, giant salad for dinner, and then finish the juices if there are any left over. Mm -hmm. And then I started adding fruit smoothies to the mix, like, you know, maybe mid afternoon or maybe in the morning, uh, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, banana. And um, because fruit is the most potent anti-cancer, I mean, berries are the most potent anti-cancer fruit. Mm -hmm. And um, the most potent anti-cancer vegetables, as it turns out, which I learned later, and I talk about this research in my book, are the allium and the cruciferous family. So the allium family is garlic, onions, and leeks. The cruciferous family is broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, bok choy, Brussels sprouts. Mm. And so I'm like, this is, this is what I was eating every day. I was eating the most potent anti-cancer vegetables every single day. Yeah. And, um, and I went from eating a t- on a typical day, like one to two servings of fruits and vegetables per day. That'd be like a banana, maybe. And then like, do French fries count? 
as a vegetable? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, or, or if my wife made dinner, maybe there would be some steamed broccoli or a baked potato. You know what I mean? That was it. Yeah. So I went from that to eating between 15 and 20 servings of fruits mm. and vegetables every single day. Yep. And that day after day after day, again, that is creating the healing momentum where you're flooding your body with vitamins, minerals, enzymes, antioxidants, and all these phytochemicals, which are also called phytonutrients, mm -hmm. that are only found in plant food. Did you feel it? You feel different? Yes. Yeah. I did feel different. Uh, I had a ton of energy. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I just felt good. Yeah. I felt energetic and um in the first few days i felt like crap but that's yeah. pretty normal like anybody who goes on a, a who does a juice fast or a, or a, a, adopts a plant-based diet or even goes all raw yeah the first few days you're gonna you're gonna have detoxification symptoms you're gonna have food withdrawals from caffeine sugar salt from a high protein high fat diet like whatever like your body is gonna be like what you know it, it has to adapt <laughs> <laughs> but it will adapt quickly. And so usually pretty, this is pretty typical for folks in our community that do this, but yeah, three or four days of eating a raw food diet and they start to feel really good. Yeah. And that was my experience too. I just had very low energy and felt kind of weird. And I hate to see people give up, you know, they do it for a day or two and they're like, Oh, I just don't feel good. I got to go, you know, I, you know, my body needs more meat or so whatever. Yeah. And then they, they quit. I'm like, no, you just had to press through. You just mm -hmm. got to get over that hump. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, I just felt good. Like I said, I was sleeping, sleeping great, lots of energy working all day. I mean, I, I found a, and I found a support system. This is important. Uh, I found a naturopathic doctor. I found mm -hmm. an integrative through him. I found an integrative oncologist yep. and you know, it, it's funny, there's a whole world of natural health practitioners mm -hmm. out there. And mm -hmm. you just have to kind of get your foot in the door. Yeah. Right. You just need to, to, once you connect with one of them, they can connect you with a bunch more. Yep. And so that's happened with me. It sort of sort of busted open the, the doors to that world. And so then I was able to, you know, found an acupuncturist and someone who did, um, you know, like Reiki and like, I, you know, mm -hmm. ch chiropractor, like, so I was just doing as much as I could, uh, as much as I could find and afford, uh, to help myself mm -hmm. and I took a lot of herbs, a lot of supplements. Do I know what, which ones helped and which ones didn't? Nope. Right. I have no idea, but the point I, I didn't have the luxury and most people don't of like running a scientific lab and studying all these individual compounds and reading, a million pages of scientific literature mm. you know what i'm saying like you were the data you were the yeah. data point it was like look i'm gonna just pump my body full of stuff that might help this yeah. is the criteria it might help and there's little to no risk of harm yeah so if it might help and there's no risk of harm i'll take it i'll eat it i'll try it i'll do it whatever mm. and um and i won't worry about you know, if, was it a waste of money maybe or whatever? Like, I'm just going to do these things that could, could be helpful. And, um, that's what I call the beat cancer mindset. And it, it, it this is where it starts. It starts with believing that healing is possible. Yeah. Like that is the absolute crux of the matter. Like you have to believe that healing is possible. Mm -hmm. And if you believe it's possible, then the next step is, okay, well, what are you going to do about it? Right? Are you going to, are you willing to take responsibility for your life and your health? Are you willing to change your life, change what you eat, change how you think, change your routine? Uh, and so that's what I did. And, and, and that's the same thing that I see cancer patients who survive against the odds doing. They all do the same things, they all have the same mindset. Mm. And uh, I've interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of cancer patients who've healed all types of cancer and uh, on my podcast and on chrisbeatcancer.com. And if you watch them, if you watch yeah. these interviews, these are just regular people like me, you'll just see the common threads. Like you'll just hear the same thing. They, we just mm -hmm. all are saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there is a path, right? There is a path to healing and we all kind of follow the same path. 
So, um, so that, and even early in my process, you know, I was finding books written by people who'd healed and, and finding natural health and practitioners and cancer mm -hmm. survivors and paying very close attention to what they were saying and what they did. And, uh, and the cool thing at that time, which at, at the time it felt, uh, <laughs> it's funny how you look at one point in your life, you feel like you don't like your situation. And then you look back and you realize, no, no, it was perfect. Yeah. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is I didn't have that many resources. The internet wasn't helpful. Mm -hmm. Social media didn't exist mm -hmm. in 2004, at least not, you know, Facebook, right? I don't know when MySpace came along, but <laughs> <laughs> there were no cancer support groups on MySpace that I knew of, yeah. especially alternative healing, you know? Um, but I had limited resources and all the information I got was from books and tapes, basically. Uh, but it was all pointing in the same direction. Like it was all raw food, juicing, fasting, forgiveness, mm -hmm. like over and over and over. Those were the themes. Yep. Um, now with the internet and everything, it's gotten harder. I feel like you know, easier and harder, easy. Cause you can find a lot of survivors like, mm. but harder because there's a lot of mixed messages. Uh, there's a lot of what I think is misinformation. And there's a, there's a, a lot of, because the health and wellness industry is, um, there's money to be made. So people will just yeah. make all kinds of claims. Well, um, you and I have uh, both had great conversation with uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton. And uh, uh, yes. so, so Dr. Bruce came on the show this time last year. So he, he got me kicked off YouTube for his views on the, uh, the vaccine and in the, in the way oh. that, the... <laughs> because you know what, you know, what does a 50 year cell biologist know about, you know, those sorts of things. But um, yeah, so he, he you know, uh, learning from him and good people like him around this idea that there is no specific when he talks about there's no gene for cancer and i think what that then does is an invitation to re-evaluate what we even think it is and it's almost taking away this platform of like you say earlier victim is done to and then that whole conditioning around outsourcing that care to somebody else which has then, you know, become an industry, one that profits. And it and it's, you know, I'd, I'd love to dive into, to, you know, to some of these these topics around, um, you know, many of the the elements of of that conditioning and and the, I guess, the bits that more specifically that the three or four elements that you say help, because they like say many of those are are free they don't require intervention or, or any change but the the biggest attack against them is being cuckooed and, yeah. and trying to find that research and when when i i guess this is the point where i was trying to make is is so much of when did science not become the truth does that make sense yeah well the thing about science is science is, has never been the truth it's always just been the pursuit of truth right it's the it's the pursuit it's the discovery of truth and if you if you are a student of science then you know science is always changing right it's always changing new discoveries are constantly being made about the universe right physics uh about the human body anatomy biology yeah you know so it's constantly changing and evolving and the knowledge base is growing and unfortunately the scientific method is easily corrupted uh, for financial gain and, and especially when it comes to pharmaceuticals it's pretty it's pretty hard to corrupt and this is where people get confused right they think well science and technology like well it is is trustworthy right sure and if we're talking about an iphone Absolutely, right? Science and technology develop the iPhone. And the iPhone either works or it doesn't, right? It e either does exactly what it claims to do or it doesn't, mm -hmm. right? If it didn't do what it claimed to do, you'd be like, this is 
I've been lied to, right? Yeah. Like, but no, they, they scientifically developed it and proved it and sold it to you and you use it and you like it, okay? But with drugs, it's a different animal because it's so easy to manipulate a, a drug study to take the, 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 to manipulate the people that they study the drug with, mm. to manipulate the results of the study, to manipulate what the study is actually showing, whether the drug is safe or not safe. It's easy to ignore side effects and just not report them, mm. right? It's easy to amplify benefits. So it's, it's, and this has just been done over and over and over for years. I mean, for decades, many, many decades by pharmaceutical companies, because they know if they can get a drug approved, right? They're using science, right? They're engaging in scientific practices mm -hmm. by doing studies that are scientifically designed. But at the end of the day, they're, they're very sophisticated and they know if they can get a drug approved mm -hmm. then billions of dollars of profit yeah. will come right from that drug. And so the incentive is to manipulate the data to get the drug approval. And then we, unfortunately, there have been many, many cases in, in uh, of drug companies being convicted of criminal behavior. Yeah. Pfizer, Merck, AstraZeneca, all the big drug companies you've heard of, Eli Lilly, they've all had criminal fines, been convicted of criminal behavior, misleading the public and doctors about the effectiveness of drugs, putting mm -hmm. drugs on the market that harmed and killed people, having to pull the drugs off the market, being fined millions and millions of dollars, even billions of dollars in some cases. Yep. But I can't think of an, a single example where the drug company was fined more money than they actually made on the drug. <laughs> right. right. So yeah. usually the fine is much less than their profit yep. on that drug. Mm -hmm. And so what they figured out is, oh, it's okay. Right. Mm. We'll, we'll just get the drug out there. We'll sell as much of it as we can, as fast as we can. And if uh, we get in trouble and we have to pull the drug off the market, we'll pay the fine. We're still up a billion dollars on the drug or 2 billion or 4 billion or whatever. So uh, next, right? right. That, that is the playbook. Mm. And, um, and, and it's not just about cancer drugs. This is pretty much yeah. all drugs. And um, it was the same playbook in 2020. Right, that that was a drug rushed to market, and uh, people were coerced into it out of fear. Mm -hmm. With and there was no long term safety studies, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it it was uh, something that I I recognized right away because I wrote a book. I mean, several chapters in my book talking about this very <laughs> tactic, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this pharmaceutical industry tactic, and so I'm like, oh, <laughs> here we go. They're doing it right now, everyone. Like, mm -hmm. pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, like, you can't trust a new pharmaceutical you're a guinea pig if you do. And um, so anyway, it's really unfortunate the way that played out because they were very successful and convinced a lot of people to take a, a brand new drug that still has no long-term safety data. I mean, you're not going to have that for seven to 10 years. Yeah, That's how long it takes for a drug to be proven safe and effective. Yeah. And many drugs, uh, even after, I mean, there was a study published last year on aspirin. Aspirin has been around for over a hundred years. Yep. And they're now saying, wait, you shouldn't prescribe a baby aspirin to people, to middle age and elderly people to help prevent heart disease as a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. They're just now figuring out, oh, wait, no, this is actually not good advice, mm -hmm. medical advice. Imagine that. And, and so like, just think about that, how, how long that drug has been on the market. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and it's, of course, it's long been generic, but still... <clears throat> for a drug to be prescribed for, you know, decades and decades and decades. And then finally, like just now realizing that it's more harmful than they thought. Yeah. So that, that, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, and yeah. if you want a deep dive, please, I hope your audience will read my book because there's three or four yeah. chapters in there that, that really will blow your mind. When, yeah. And it's not just Chris making wild claims. Like I've, I've got all these incredible sources from drug companies, from their own mm -hmm. studies, from industry papers, like stuff that's just wild. So at the end of the day, we, we are in a, um, a very unique time in history where the pharmaceutical industry has, is one of the most powerful industries in the world. They control the medical industry yep. and patients, you know, at the end of the day, they don't care about your health, mm -hmm. right? They care about making money. Uh, they're making as much money as possible off of you. 
yeah. as a patient. Uh, if you get well, great. We're all excited. If you don't get well, well, they still made money. So yeah, I think one of the things you said earlier about the um, the Western civilization and this idea that cancer is a byproduct of a wealthy society of of both um, of of both diet and lifestyle. I think there's there's another there's another bit that just blows minds which is when we have this understanding this belief that the body is designed to heal itself and i don't think many people and i guess i was trying to say this but less eloquently earlier is is that so many people have been used to outsourcing health that they only return to health by seeing a doctor that they've lost sight that that is what this wonderful vessel has been capable of since the very beginning is that it's naturally capable of healing ourselves. And I, I think that, you know, even for some people hearing that now must be a what? Like, wow, like, how do I do that? Yes, you're right. Um, I think it, it's the way I like to explain it is your body is designed to heal, mm. but there are factors in your life that may be causing disease, right? Yeah. And so you have to identify the disease causing factors. Mm -hmm. What is making you sick or keeping you sick? And uh, the medical industry has no interest in that, right? They just want to give you a pill for the disease and keep mm -hmm. you vertically ill, right? You're mm -hmm. vertical. You can function. You're not horizontal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're not well, but you're, you're a loyal not. loyal repeat customer. Yeah. You, you're not bedridden either. You know, you can get through the day. And you're a lifetime customer of one drug and then two and then three and then six and 10. Yeah. And so, so that, that's one way to approach disease, uh, mm -hmm. which is ineffective and, and people are not getting cured for sure. They're just becoming dependent on pharmaceuticals. But the other way is where you step back and say, okay, I have a health issue. Mm -hmm. What in my life could be contributing to it? And you put on the detective hat and you start to read and research and learn, especially from people who've healed that issue, which now because of the internet, you can find, right? You mm. can find, I've interviewed people who've healed lupus, who've healed MS, who've healed, um, uh, you know, diabetes, mm. uh, who've of course healed all types of cancers. So chronic diseases can be healed. And what you'll find is that the same factors that are causing cancer are causing these other chronic diseases. It's mm. what you're putting in your mouth. Yeah. It's your, your weight, lack of exercise, it's cigarettes and alcohol, it's pharmaceuticals, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? They're causing more disease. And even just your attitude and your mindset and, yeah. and really negative emotions like stress and anger and unforgiveness. Like, and so all of these factors, contribute to ill health. And the yeah. good news is, and this is the epiphany I had, the way I'm living is killing me. Yes. Right. That was the epiphany. And it's like, if you're willing to just admit that maybe this is your fault, nobody's trying to blame you or shame you. But if you're willing yeah. to look in the mirror and say, you know what? Okay. Maybe it's my fault. Mm. And if it's, if this is my fault, then that means I need to make some changes. Mm. Right. So what do I need to change? And then you have just put yourself on a different path, right? Yeah. You've put yourself, you take, you sort of stepped off of the victim's path <laughs> and then onto the path of victory, right? Mm. The victor's path. And, um, and that's where you're empowered. Like you realize, okay, I have to change my life. I have to learn. I have to read and research. I have to try new things. Like I have to take the wheel. And I can't, like you said, uh, delegate my health to someone else, yeah. to a doctor who, by the way, they probably won't remember your name if you see them in the grocery store. I mean, they're saying they're seeing 40 people a day every day. You think they're really going to be like, oh, they're too busy. Mm. <laughs> you know? mm. and, and the problem with doctors, it's not that they're bad people. They're just in this terrible system. Of course. It's a terrible system that rewards them for basically prescribing drugs and performing yeah. surgical procedures and not actually it doesn't actually give them enough time to spend with their patients yeah. to help their patient actually restore their health and some of the best best doctors i know i mean they're 
integrative and holistic doctors and mm. they spend an hour or two hours with each mm. patient and they really dig into that person's life and help them figure out, okay, what are you doing? What are you eating? Tell me about your routine. Tell me about your day. Like, you know, like, tell me about your relationships. Mm. What's going on in your life? Like, let's try to, yeah. let's solve this mystery together of what is making you sick. Yeah. You well, where do you your- work? right? You work in a chemical factory? Okay, well, hey, right. uh, this could be part of the problem. Yeah. So, and, and just to, to put a finer point on all this, like we know what's causing cancer. Here it is. Number one, smoking. It's the number one cause. Number two is obesity. That's unpopular, mm-hmm. but obesity mm-hmm. is the second leading cause of cancer. Well, what causes obesity? Our diet mm-hmm. and lack of exercise. So that falls under that umbrella category of, okay, Uh, If you're eating too much meat and dairy, junk food, fast food, processed food, restaurant food, you're consuming too many calories, Mm -hmm. you're going to gain weight. And when you gain weight, your body is in a suboptimal state. Mm -hmm. And excess body fat produces hormones that fuel cancer growth. It produces inflammatory molecules Mm -hmm. that uh, promote cancer growth, that create an environment that's permissive to cancer growth. And actually... Uh, produces excess fatty acids that clog up your immune cells. Hmm. That's one of the biggest revelations of the last, I don't know, few years is that immune cells in an obese environment are actually themselves obese. Wow. Think about that. Your Hmm. immune cells are your army. They're supposed to fight off viruses, bacteria, pathogens, parasites, right? Cancer cells. This is your army that's supposed to defend your body. Mm-hmm. And if your army is slow and sluggish and obese and bloated, it's not gonna be a very effective army. Mm-hmm. And so that's what obesity does. And, and by the way, speaking of COVID, that's why being obese was one of, of the, the highest risk factors, mm-hmm. aside from just being elderly or having other chronic diseases. But obesity was a, a, a major risk factor for severe COVID hospitalization and death. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess it's like, because the body's under strain, the body is not doing what it's, yeah, the, the thing I always come back to is the goldfish bowl analogy. Yes. Is that you visually see the goldfish bowl being dirty and murky. You, you, you don't, you don't medicate the goldfish. You clearly change their environment. That's right. And I think the more we tune in and, and I think, you know, Darren Olian has got a, a podcast called, um, fatal conveniences and so many of these things that are fatal for us are part of everyday life they're so convenient that we don't even realize that it's there yeah fast food being the big one right Right. and and transportation right lack of exercise because we're sitting down all the time like sitting at work at a desk we're sitting in a car or on a bus or on a train right like we're sitting down to eat we're sitting to watch tv and then we go lay down and get in bed like like we're just always sitting down we're not walking we're not like a lot of us i mean some people do physical labor obviously for their for work but a lot of people don't and um you're right yeah there's so many and these are like this is the curse of wealth yes because many of us live, I mean, you know, if you have a computer and you're using Zoom and you have, you know, right, <laughs> you're in a wealthy nation probably, right? And you have access to unlimited food, right? Mm-hmm. To, to, mm-hmm. to travel, to resources, to transportation. Yeah, and that, that is the curse of Western countries and, and yeah. wealth is that um, we, um, we're overfed, we're yeah. undernourished, we are, we're getting soft and, yeah. uh, and sick. So like, okay, so smoking, uh, being overweight, food, alcohol is Mm -hmm. a group one carcinogen. Mm -hmm. Alcohol also contributes to obesity if you drink a lot, Mm -hmm. but it, but alcohol, um, when you drink it, you're consuming ethanol and that's, uh, highly toxic to the body. So you, you know, if you're drinking daily, you're increasing your cancer risk. Mm -hmm. Even if it's one drink, if you drink daily, your risk goes up. There's no amount of alcohol that is a safe amount, Mm -hmm. but I understand that it's nice to enjoy a glass of wine every once in a while or a beer, a couple of beers, like, you know, but you really want to think about don't drink every day if you want to keep your cancer risk low. Yeah. And then beyond that, you know, thinking about your environment, like, like the chemical factory, like where Mm -hmm. do you work? Are Mm -hmm. you exposed to toxic 
fumes, smoke, debris, dirt, you know, like chemicals, like where do you work? Because yeah. I mean, I knew a guy who was a printer and he got pancreatic cancer and he was bringing them print fumes all day, right. you know? So it's like, these are real factors and real risks that you, you have to just stop and think, okay, like, what am I exposed to? What could be mm. harming me? Didn't yeah. the um didn't the World Health Organization list list shift work as a possible carcinogen? Yes. Night yeah. shift work mm. increases your risk of cancer because it you know, humans need to sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that that knocks uh, the, the work of Dr. Sachin Panda it talks about the circadian code and, and how important it is for us to live in harmony with that rhythm of the sun, get sleep at the good time. With nature. And, uh, yeah, with nature. And one of the things that he talks about in that is, I guess it's another word for fasting, is about reducing your time, your time eating window. What do you, what in your recent, you, you've used the word fasting quite a bit. I know that you talk about the Daniel fast, 21 day Daniel fast. What is it that you think um, fasting does to the body's ability to heal itself? It's kind of counter, isn't it? Fasting is incredible. It really is one of the most powerful things you can do for yourself physically, and it costs you nothing. Right. Right. It literally costs no dollars, right? No pounds, no euros. <laughs> costs you nothing. Um, but, you know, fasting is something that happens in nature all the time because animals don't have access to three meals a day, yeah. every day. Right. And so animals go through periods of food scarcity for, mm -hmm. for days at a time. And humans went through periods of food scarcity for days at a time and sometimes weeks at a time, our ancestors, I mean. Mm. And uh, when you go through this process, which is either voluntary or involuntary fasting, of course, it's a relig religious practice as well. Yep. Your, your body goes into to repair and protection mode. Your cells hunker down and they, all, they, they undergo autophagy, which is self-eating. So they start, they break down uh, parts of themselves for fuel mm -hmm. and your body starts burning off fat excess body fat and breaking down tissue like tumors yeah. for example to use for fuel and the the analogy i like to use is, is the cabin is the uh the cabin uh the cabin analogy which is if you were in a cabin and it, there was a blizzard and you were trapped in a cabin and uh you had a fireplace and firewood to keep warm, you would burn your firewood. But then when you run out of firewood, what do you do, right? Well, you're gonna start burning off, you're gonna start burning anything you can that's non-essential. So you're not gonna burn your food, right? <laughs> you're not gonna burn your blankets, but you're gonna start breaking the chairs, right? You're gonna start breaking the cabinets up, like anything in there that you can break down and throw in the fire for fuel to stay warm and stay alive, you'll do. And yep. so your body does the same thing when you're fasting. It starts breaking down non-essential tissue. Yep. And the essential tissue, like your, your heart, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And your, even your organs, if you, if you fast long enough, your organs will even shrink in size. Your body will reduce the size of your organs. But, wow. but mainly, your, it focuses its attention on house cleaning, so internal house cleaning. And cancer mm -hmm. cells are, do not adapt well to fasting. They're, they're not as metabolically flexible as a healthy cell. And so fasting weakens cancer cells and causes cancer cells to die. So that's good. So there's, a, there's just a number of benefits. And the other one I should mention too, is when you fast, you actually undergo, there's a process in fasting that is called uh, st stem cell regeneration. Mm -hmm. And fasting triggers this regenerative response. And so during the fast, you'll have old and damaged cells die, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the senile, senescent cells in your body. They're just old, they're weak, they should have died, and the fasting just kind of pushes them over the edge. Mm -hmm. And so you have a sig significant amount of immune cells that will die during a fast. That doesn't sound good, but what happens is as soon as you start eating again, your body ramps up production of new immune cells. And so Dr. Walter Longo proved this, that fasting regenerates your immune system. Yeah. That is really powerful. So you think about you're weakening cancer cells, you're detoxifying your body, mm. and you're regenerating your immune system with a fast. And the minimum fast 
to, to accomplish, to get some benefit is three days. Mm -hmm. The three days on water, you have, you have achieved a, a measurable benefit. Mm -hmm. um, we recommend three to five days on mm -hmm. water. That's, that's the sort of an ideal window. Most people can handle it. If you're taking medication, you should work with a doctor, you know, but most quote unquote healthy people mm -hmm. can do three to five days on water without any problem. The, typically the worst effect is they just have no energy. They feel yeah. really, really tired and you should be resting anyway when you fast. <laughs> Last year I did a three day fast just without any preparation. I was totally stupid, but um, I was doing it. Day one I found was a mental test because I knew I had three more like days to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, going to bed, like having not eaten, knowing I've got two more sleeps after that. It was, and then the next day physically I felt optimal. Like I felt like I'd had a full 24 hours. My body was starting and then day three was spiritual. Like I was handing mm. it over. I was grateful for every single thing in my life, the ability. Uh, and it was an emotional process. And that was just, that was just three days, but uh, well, I'm glad you shared that because yeah, I mean, even just a three day fast can really have a profound impact on you. 100%. And it's, and I'm glad you brought up the mental and phys and the spiritual side of it, because absolutely. You, one thing that fasting does is it gives you this pr profound sense of gratitude for food. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> right? just the simple basics. And, um, you know, my kids were looking at me and I was just like crying as I was just, I was just, I was crying because I was just grateful for everything. Like, it's daddy, you're right. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> and, it will make um, you more emotional and things will bubble up. You know, the thing is food is medicine. Yeah right? Sure. And but food is also mm -hmm. medication. Yes. And so when we eat, we we activate pleasure centers in our brain yeah, when, yeah. when we eat food and uh, that medication effect of food helps us suppress pain, yeah, right? Yeah. Emotional, mental and emotional pain. And so when you stop eating, yeah. you actually are, are stopping a medication. Mm. And so emotional pain will bubble up. Yeah right? Painful memories, like resentments, guilt, shame, anxieties, like the, those emotions will become very, very real mm -hmm. and present during a water fast, especially an extended water fast. And um, that, that that's the perfect opportunity to address them. Yeah, right. To deal with those emotions, like to be very cognizant and aware and analyze yourself and also forgive the people who've hurt you. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned that a few times. And um, I have a question from an audience member. Um, and, and I guess one of the perspectives that I really like that you share in the book is that I know that you started the blog Chris Beat Cancer, but your perspective changed to about healing, you know, that the, you understand that you, you're healing your cancer. And with this, do you have a, a perspective on the belief that emotions, trapped emotions have any links to um, cancer yes and i wouldn't call them trapped emotions necessarily i would just call them unresolved sure so and what i mean by that is um there are there are i'm going to try to explain it in a succinct way because it's a really sort of vast and, and mm -hmm. deep rabbit hole but stress suppresses your immune system that's the big, big idea number one here. When you're in a state of stress, your physical body responds with adrenaline and cortisol, and those chemicals suppress your immune system. So, well, what causes stress? What is stress? Stress is negative emotion, mm -hmm. right? So there's a, there's a long list of stressful emotions, and those are anger, bitterness, resentment well that's from your past yeah right those and that's always usually directed at people in your past that have hurt mm -hmm. you right? you're angry at them you're bitter toward them you're resentful you're unforgiving of those people mm -hmm. also guilt and shame right and that's that's internalized like you're guilty for things that you've done wrong you're ashamed of your mistakes right again this is from the past but like when you say trapped like th this is that stuff from your past, right? That's unresolved. Mm -hmm. In the present, the negative emotions that cause stress would be like envy and jealousy, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then in the future, 
the future-based negative emotions are fear, worry, and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people are, are just constantly bouncing back and forth mm -hmm. between being worried about the future, jealous of somebody in the present, and angry at somebody in the past, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. they're just in a constant state of stress. And not to mention, oh, your finances, you know, your personal relationships, like your work, you know, so we have all these other stresses too. your kids. And um, <clears throat> so we're bombarded with uh, stressful uh, either situations or emotions or thoughts. Okay, so now I've established we have a stress problem, <laughs> many of us, right? And so um, when you're in a state of chronic stress day in, day out, day in, day out, you're in also in a state of chronic immunosuppression, and that leads you down this path of mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. You don't get cancer for being stressed out for a week or a month, you know, mm -hmm. but it's people that have been in this, uh, this stre vicious stress cycle for mm -hmm. years and years and years. So there is a way out of it, right? And the solution is you have to sort of deal with each category of stress mm -hmm. separately. You have to, first of all, like be aware of what's stressing you and then start dealing with those things. So from your past, you have to forgive the people that have hurt you. Yeah, because if you're holding on to the pain that they've caused you and the anger, you're just keeping yourself in a state of pain. Mm -hmm. Like it's you keeping you there, right? They caused you pain, it happened. But you're keeping you're holding on to the pain because you want justice, which is natural. But if you want to free yourself from the pain, then you mm -hmm. forgive, mm -hmm. you give them to God. And this is what I did. I made a decision to forgive every person who's ever hurt me in my life. And mm -hmm. I just one by one by name and i didn't do it all in one sitting right but i deliberately would just take time in in a you can do it in a prayerful sort of meditative state you just sit there and you think through your life and you let those people come up right you revisit those past painful memories mm. which I, I know is not fun but you have to do it you revisit it and you just in that moment say okay god you know what they did you know how i feel about it they hurt me i'm still angry i still f resent them i still you know, mm. but I'm choosing to forgive them. Like right mm. now in the middle of the pain, I'm choosing to forgive them and I'm letting it go and they're all yours. Yeah. Right. That's the important thing. You just say, they're all yours. You can deal with them. I'm not going to hold on for justice or vengeance or whatever. Mm. They're all yours. Yeah. And I'm not going to carry it anymore. And so that's the forgiveness prayer. Like, that's it. And then you just realize like, okay, I made that decision now. I just have to stick with it. Yeah. And if the feelings start to creep in again, you just say, nope, I forgive them. Mm -hmm. God, they're all yours. I'm not going to let the pain and the anger like creep into my heart and my mind and steal my joy. Yeah. So and so I did that for every person, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Every person who ever hurt me. And it did take time. But it's just a process. And, you know, every day I would just sit down and just, or just driving in the car or doing whatever I'm doing. If I remember some painful memory, I would just stop and say, oh, hey, okay, there's somebody I haven't forgiven. I, I, that I need to just right now, I'm just going to choose to forgive them. So that's how you deal with the past. You got to forgive yourself with the present. You got to just catch yourself with the negative thoughts, right? You got to catch yourself being judgmental or critical. You got to catch yourself being envious and just be like, whoa. I'm being judgmental right now. I'm going to stop being judgmental, mm -hmm. right? I'm being envious. I don't need to be envious of that person. I have so much to be thankful for in my own life. Like, let mm -hmm. me just focus back on what's good in my life. By the way, gratitude was the secret to, to happiness for me during cancer because mm -hmm. I had everything to be unhappy about, right? Like, like, oh, you think your life sucks? I've got cancer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. I have a right to be pissed off. I have a mm -hmm. right to be a jerk because I have cancer, but I just realized like, I can't live this way. And so let me count my blessings. Like what's good in my life. I have a wife mm -hmm. who loves me. I have a baby on the way. I have a roof over my head. I have enough food to pay my next, I mean, enough food to eat. I have enough money to pay my next set of bills. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I can walk and talk. I can feed myself. I can get out of bed. I'm not mm -hmm. dying in the hospital today. Mm -hmm. So like, as I would start like thinking through like, what's good in my life, then all of a sudden like, my attitude changed, right? Like that's practice. That's the gratitude practice. That's, that's how you do it. So that's dealing with your present. And then the future, when you start feeling anxiety and fear, 
about the future and worrying about the future, you have to catch those thoughts mm -hmm. and stop and say, okay, I'm not going to worry about the future. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. But Jesus gives good advice. Like that's good <laughs> advice. You should take it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Yeah. So I just realized, okay, I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm going to focus on today. And I'm just, God, I trust you with tomorrow. So yeah. like, I know all this is easier said than done, but, yeah. but this really is, this is the way, this is the method. Well, like, it's, it's why you've got the book like this, which <laughs> is uh, to allow people to journey on the daily, which is the Beat Cancer Daily 365 Days of Inspiration, Encouragement and Action Steps. That's right. That's where I, I wrote that follow-up book as yeah. just daily, daily encouragement, daily reminders, daily practical advice, yeah. just like the thing about cancer or even health or life yeah. is it is just a daily journey, right? Yeah. It's you just got today at one day at a time to focus on, like just focus on getting today, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it's easy to get distracted by like yeah. what happened yesterday or what might happen tomorrow. And at the end, at the end of the day, neither of those things matter. Mm. So that was just my way of, you know, I just know, especially for cancer, every day is a struggle, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's physically or mentally or emotionally or spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so that's a really special book that, that I'm glad I was, COVID gave me the opportunity to sit down and, and write it. <laughs> that was the, the silver lining for me was I was able to write two books because of the pandemic, Beat Cancer Daily and then the Beat Cancer Kitchen yeah. cookbook, which is all plant-based. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That's amazing. I'm, I'm conscious of your time, super uh, want to be respectful of your time. Can I ask you a couple of quick fire questions? Please. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have a hard stop, so we're, we're, we're totally fine. That's very gracious of you. Thank you. You talk about in your book how important um, – chiropractor and acupuncture was what was it about those two practices that helped you know there's something incredibly therapeutic when when other people put their hands on you hmm. you know and i i wish i had a a more articulate way or, or scientific way to explain it but having a, a professional uh, put their hands on you and work on your body, whether it's deep tissue massage, any kind of massage, right? Massage therapy or chiropractic or acupuncture. I just, and they've done studies for sure. I mean, the, mm. one of the, one of the science I could, I could, one little bit of science I can share is that, yeah, it actually calms down your nervous system. Mm -hmm. So those type of therapies, they, they calm your nervous system. They get, put, get you out of a state of stress. Yep. And that's good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's what really what acupuncture is all about is working with the nervous system. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I think, um, incorporating that into your life is, is wonderful. And also those people can connect you with other people. So that again, you're getting into that scene, right? Yeah, you're yeah, getting yeah. into the health and wellness scene. So you'll, there are ancillary benefits, like just the connections that you can make. Mm -hmm. through your chiropractor or through an acupuncturist or especially if you share who you are and what you're going through right i have cancer and mm -hmm. i'm trying to get well and this is what i'm doing do you know anybody that can help mm -hmm. me who and then be like oh you have to call that you have to go see this person they're amazing they're an herbalist or they're like so you just never know like what's gonna what doors will open for you when you start you know visiting and connecting with these type yeah, of yeah. Um, healing practitioners so yeah i'm i'm big well, advocate put, of that i put out into my community um that i was interviewing you i said does anybody have any questions and, and and guess who replied the holistic the holistic practitioner the chiropractor the meditation the yoga teacher you know all these people so um, <laughs> that's yeah, awesome they've been following you some time and they were really looking forward to hearing this conversation so that's I'm amazing sure, i'm sure that section will be good for them to, to listen back to one of the things that i hear in the breathwork circle is about creating an alkaline state through the power of breathwork is that something you're familiar with and has anything to do with um creating an environment where cancer cannot thrive i think there's a so when i first started reading and researching the, the the early information was was the alkaline 
mm-hmm. message, right? It was, it was, I'm just, just call it the alkaline theory, okay? Mm-hmm. That you have to alkalize your body, you have to, that cancer can't thrive in an alkaline state, cancer's acidic and this and that. And so I, I bought into that idea and I was, the raw food diet is, is known as the alkaline diet. Mm-hmm. Well, I was doing that. I was eating this perfect raw food diet, no cheating. I was testing my urine. I was testing my saliva mm-hmm. and it was acidic, 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 always. Mm-hmm. And it was very frustrating. And it, I was kind of, kind of bothered, you know, it was just bothering me. I'm like, what, what is the problem? Like, I'm, you know, why is it acidic? Why is it? Well, eventually I was just like, whatever, I'm just not going to worry about it. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to keep pumping in the nutrition. And then once I started blogging and sharing my story and then actually reading the scientific literature, because I wanted to make sure I wasn't saying something that was just totally wrong. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand why what I did helped me. And Mm -hmm. if I was just a fluke or lucky, or if there was actually science that can, a scientific basis for nutrition, supplying body, the body, the uh, the ammunition it needs to fight cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I found was, is that I don't think alkaline or uh, has anything to do with healing. You know, you have different pH levels in different parts of your body. Your stomach's acidic, your small intestine is less acidic, your colon is more alkaline, your blood is more alkaline. So you can't alkalize your body, like that's a myth. Um, Now there are foods that produce excess acid. So animal protein, for example, produces excess acid like uric acid that your body has to neutralize Mm -hmm. and excess uric acid can cause gout. For example, like you can have definitely have problems like acidosis from, from consuming too much acidic food. But what I've found is more important to focus on really is just focus on the nutrition. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's not about the acid or alkaline. It's about the vitamins, minerals, enzymes, antioxidants, and all these wonderful phytonutrients in plant food. Right. And of course, Mm -hmm. oxygen, (laughs) hydrogen and oxygen from water, (laughs) Mm -hmm. oxygen from the air and hydrogen too. We're breathing it and we're drinking it. So like the, all of those elements, I think, um, in synergy are what is creating health. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, I I just feel like that the the alkaline conversation, it's just a little bit reductionist and and oversimplistic. And yeah, so I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't really think it matters. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that. My last quick fire question is just to honor your, it's been 20 years almost since your uh, diagnosis. And man, you're looking younger than ever. Like, you know, I saw, <laughs> I saw the uh, post-surgery video, which you recorded 10 years after surgery. And, and you look even younger than then as well. So, you know, something is is uh, incredibly alive and well. And I know that you're married and you have a a young family too and uh it's such a blessing to to hear your story and you come share that Thank with you. us and, and and obviously i i can barely scratch the surface with your story in this one hour conversation i would just encourage any listeners to to head to uh, chrisbeatcancer.com go check out the books go check out your podcast your blogs um and I'd, I'd kind of love to know at what point you um adjusted to being able to live not only cancer, I guess, would you call it cancer free, but cancer is part of your life. Now it is part of, dare we say your business. It's the, it's the, it's the way that you work in the world. And it's almost, you must be having conversations about cancer every single day. How do you keep that healthy and non-consuming uh, in, in a, in a way that's, I guess, healthy for you, for you as a human being? Um. That's a, that's a great question, actually, that I'm not asked very often. (laughs) And the answer is, uh, when I first started to get well, you know, a couple years after my, my diagnosis, uh, and really two, three, four years in that, in that sort of interim period where I was feeling good, feeling more confident feeling optimistic that I, the recurrent, I had prevented this recurrence that I was told was basically a certainty Hmm. and that I was going to survive. Um, I, I wanted to get as far away from cancer as possible. 
Yeah, you know what I mean? I just wanted to, my sole focus. It was not to write a book or do a blog or anything. I, I wasn't doing that. Right. My sole focus was to get well. Yeah. Right. That was it. And then once I got well, it was like, let's just continue with my life. Like, I don't want to, I just want cancer to be in the rear view mirror. Yeah. Um, but after the five year mark, uh, people just, I, people just started asking me like, what did you do? Like, I, you know, you didn't do chemo. what did you do? I, you know? And so I started telling my story to people mm. and I just had this nagging sense that maybe I needed to not walk away from it. Yeah. That maybe I needed to share it publicly in some way because I knew there were tons of cancer patients out there that needed encouragement. I knew what, how afraid they were. Yeah. And so, and that's when, um, you know, that was 2010. So like YouTube had been going for a little while, social media, you know, MySpace, and then Facebook, you know, were, were really uh, taking off. And it was like, and blogging was a big thing. And so it, I finally, at that point, it just sort of was like, oh, I guess I could, I could do a blog. <laughs> Right. Like, and I had a buddy who kind of knew how to do it. And I was like, Hey, how do you, how do I, how do I do a blog? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So I just started writing down my, my experience and my, what I'd learned and started making YouTube videos, sharing what I'd learned. And yeah, it just started taking over my life. And, it, and the feedback I got immediately was like, conf, you know, confirming that, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe this, I really do need to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And, um, because there were so many people that were like clearly needed and wanted help. And, uh, I didn't expect there to be such a big response so quickly, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's what happened. And then, so I, it just was my part-time passion for the first five years mm -hmm. from 2010 to 2015. And in that time, my audience just kept growing and growing and growing. And I was just, I just knew like, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I was in real estate before that, which is a career I enjoyed, but, but there was a different level of fulfillment from yeah. doing this. Yeah. Um, from just being a patient advocate. And uh, I mean, I like, I didn't even know how to describe myself. Like people are like, what do you do? I was like, I don't even know. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just talking about health and healing and, and surviving cancer and trying to give people hope and encouragement and practical action steps mm -hmm. so they can survive. Like yeah. just try, trying to guide people on this health path, you know? And so, but anyway, yeah, uh, around that five year mark of doing it, it was kind of like, wow, this is, I think I could maybe do this full time. Yeah. It looks like I could probably do this full time. And, um, and so that's when I just made a conscious decision to like, okay, I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to finish this book that I've been wanting to and trying to write. And I'm just really going to focus on that and then, um, and create a course for people to help them in a private community. And, uh, you call that's called square one, which you can find on mm -hmm. crispycancer.com if anybody's interested, but, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's how it wasn't, it wasn't an overnight thing. You know, it was like five years of me just doing it because I love to do it for no money. Um, it just, because it was so important to me. And then, um, yeah. And then it just all of a sudden financially started to also make sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And then I got a book deal and that was great. I was like, oh man. So yeah. And then, so crispy cancer, the book came out in 2018. That was 15 mm -hmm. years after my diagnosis. And mm -hmm. I mean, 15 years is a long time to learn mm -hmm. stuff, <laughs> you know? And so if my book is good, right? If, if, if a person thinks my book is good, it's because yeah, I'd been learning and reading and researching and lived it for 15 years yeah. before I wrote the book. So I think if I'd written it any sooner, it just wouldn't have been nearly as good. <laughs> it's incredible. It's a great resource. It's going to be, it's going to be incredible in the hands of, of the people who need it to be. And, um, I have a word here at always better than yesterday. It's called heart print. And, and the word is used to describe the legacy of our work, of our interactions, the possibilities that that we create through serving other people. And I'd just love to know what you believe Chris Beat Cancer's heart print will be on this world. 
<clears throat> oh man. Well, you know, I don't know, but I can tell you what my intention is, mm -hmm. right? And my intention, I've already sort of explained it, but I'm just trying to be a light in the dark. Mm. You know, I know how scary cancer is. I, the, the darkness is the fear, right? And the confusion, that's the darkness. And uh, I'm just trying to be a light just to help people see like there is a way out, right? There, here's the path. Like, let me show you how you can change your life, that you don't have to be a victim, that many people have followed, have gone down this same path and have survived and thrived and gotten their life back and that their life is even better after cancer than it was before, which is hard to imagine when you've been diagnosed, that you're, you feel like your life's over. And so to me, I feel like I, I'm here to encourage people, to give them hope, to hopefully give them inspiration. And then, and then of course, give them the, the very, very practical, granular, detailed advice. Like, here's exactly what you need to change about your life and how to do it to help yourself. So that's my intention. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> and the impact, I mean, who can measure it? I don't know. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like when you put mm -hmm. your story out there, which as you were doing, you, you know, you're putting yourself out there and putting information out. You just have no idea who, who you're reaching. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was funny. We went to, um, we went to lunch yesterday after church to, uh, there's a place that does like a pretty, some pretty good veggies. And we went to get some veggie plates at this local restaurant. And, and I sit down, well, when we were sitting, <laughs> this is just funny how life is, but <laughs> we're at the front of the restaurant. We're waiting to be seated. And um, the hostess was like, uh, she, she was like, well, do y'all, are y'all okay with sitting in the back? And we're like, what do you mean? She's like, well, we have this kind of little back room that um, we just open it up when, when it gets a little crowded. Mm. And we're like, yeah, okay. Uh, and so she took us back there and, uh, and we sit down and I sit at the table and I look up and there's a lady at the next table looking right at me. And she was like, are you Chris? <laughs> Bro, come on. And I'm like, yes. And she was like, she was like, oh. And so I was like, okay, I need to talk, you know. So yeah. I, I got up and, and I went and talked to her. And she, you know, she is a cancer survivor and she had read my book and she yeah. was actually a part of our, uh -huh. our, our support coaching community. And it's like, you know, just this incredible divine appointment, you know, that, um, and so we just had a really wonderful visit and she's doing great. And she was there with her mother and, and I believe her son. And um, so that's just one example of like, you just never know like who you're reaching. Like that's the, the incredible thing about the internet, right? Or even just writing a book before the internet. Like when you, when you put something out there that's a value to the world, and I, certainly I hope it's a value, right? You put something out there, like you just don't, there's no way to measure the impact you can have, but um, you know, if I died tomorrow in a car wreck, I, I would be very, I mean, I'm very happy with, you know, the amount of people that I know I've impacted just from the feedback, from the, the emails and the messages and the one-on-ones. And so it's all just gravy from here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? I, it's I like, I'm just so blessed to be alive. I love that power to that. I, I don't know whether you talk about her publicly, but I love the way that you honor your wife in, the, in your book as, as someone that uh, was there for you, walked with you, cared for. Um, you know, what, what, what do you have to say about your wife and, and, and to anyone that might be listening who is caring for someone that may be going through cancer? <clears throat> my wife had a hard time in the beginning because she didn't understand my choices. Yeah. But but she came around pretty quickly, um, especially after we had the experiences with the oncologist yeah. that treated us so badly. I think that kind of was a wake up call for her about the reality of the medical industry and how cold and careless it can be. Mm -hmm. um, and so she she's one of the most courageous people I know um, because I wanted to start a family. Mm. Like I had this diagnosis and it was like, oh man, the clock's ticking on my life. And I don't even know, like, like I'm 26. Like I always thought I'd, you know, have a family and like 
I want to be a dad. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, that didn't matter to me until I got cancer diagnosis. Then all of a sudden it was like, man, gosh, like I really do want to be a dad. Mm. I just want to experience, have that life experience. And um, yeah, and sh she agreed to start a family with me, not knowing if I would even be alive mm. to help her raise a child. And like that is just, it gets me a little choked up because it's just, I mean, such an active sacrificial love, you know? I mean, she loved me that much that she was willing to do that. And um, so we started trying to have, you know, we started trying, you know what trying means. <laughs> and um, uh, a year after I was diagnosed, I was back in the hospital holding this beautiful wow. baby girl. Wow. Like, and, and that added more fuel to my survival fire, yeah. Yeah. right? Because now it's like, I, I, now I really have to live. Before it was like, I have to live for my parents and my wife because I didn't want them to have to bury me. Yeah. And it's like, now I got to live for this little baby girl too. Mm. And that little baby girl turns 18 in three weeks. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, madness. Like, madness. Yeah, man. It's crazy. I cannot believe it. I mean, it it's does incredible. just feel like yesterday, like her just being a, just a newborn, you know? So that, I mean, that is, if there's one story I can tell you about my wife, man, that is, that is my wife. She She's my best friend. She's hilarious. She's beautiful. She's just an awesome mom. And she, um, yeah. And she, she just made this incredible, just took a leap of faith with me, you know, and stuck with me the whole way, even though she, she didn't understand what I was doing mm. and she believed in me and supported me in, in the, the best way she could. And, and we have two, two daughters. So we had another girl about three and a half years after the first. And so she is, 14 so i have two teenage girls in the house and uh it's fun <laughs> and still a whole head of hair and as they looking younger than ever man my, still, my brother I, my hair is a little thinner than it used to be <laughs> a little thinner but it's still pretty good i'm not complaining <laughs> uh, you're looking good my friend and and you've been very gracious for your time thank you for staying on a bit longer and yeah absolutely honored to share time and space with you thank you for all that you're putting out into the world thank you for the the possibilities you're creating through having conversations that aren't the norm um uh, and i find it very very endearing very very powerful and just want to say thank you for that i definitely encourage anybody listening to go to chrisbeatcancer.com check out the the books the resources the podcast the community whatever you feel drawn to go go be part of it um chris thank you i appreciate all that you're doing and i'd just be honored if you'd leave us a final thought from your good self thank you ryan yeah it's been fun to, to hang out with you and talk to you and like just connect with someone who's like-minded is just great. Like I love being able to do what I do. I'm just Thanks, so thankful man. I can do it. I'm super blessed. Um, the final thought is um, your choices matter. Hmm. That's, that's a big idea. You know, your choices matter. Your choices create your future and your choices have created your present you know, where you're at right now. And um, especially as an adult, you know, as a child, a lot of choices are made for us, right? But once you become an adult, like your choices really do direct the course of your life. And if you're willing to, to take responsibility that your choices got you where you are and that your choices can get you where you want to go, right? Then uh, you, you are empowering yourself, right? You're empowering yourself to change. And um, this is what I had to do. <laughs> right? I had to do it. I was I was wired kind of wired that way anyway. But it doesn't matter. Like, at the end of the day, any person can change their diet, right? Any person can start exercising, any person can forgive. Mm. Right? Uh, these are things that anyone can do, and they cost you almost nothing. And some of the most powerful things you can do for yourself, and you alluded to this earlier, uh, cost you nothing, right? Fasting, faith, forgiveness, uh, fitness. They all start with an F. Have you noticed that? Food. <laughs> <laughs> Even healthy food. It really doesn't cost much more than junk food. It really mm -hmm, doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, that big idea that, that if you're willing to, 
to make different choices and just change your daily routine, like you can really have an incredible mm. uh, outcome. Like it's like, and I talk about this in Beat Cancer Daily, but a small change adds up. That's what I, I like to say. Mm -hmm. Like, so all the little changes that you make to your life over time add up to big change, right? And there are big changes that you should make, like make the big changes for sure. But mm -hmm. all the small changes add up too. Mm -hmm. They call it the long tail, but um, in statistics, right? It's called the long tail. But, um, but yeah, you know, I think we just get conditioned. We get in ruts and we get conditioned and we end up in cycles in life. And, and typically it's cycles of bad behavior, the vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in a vicious cycle, your health and your life kind of spiral downward. But you can interrupt that process. And when you start making different choices, you you go, you, you start the cycle spinning the other way. And that's called the virtuous cycle. Mm. And that's where things improve, <laughs> right? It's where your life and your health, they spiral up, <laughs> mm. right? Things get better. So yeah, your choices matter. Your choices either create a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle. Chris, God bless you and your family. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Ryan. It's been really fun. Thank you for making it to the end of the interview here on YouTube. I hope that our time spent together has left you a little bit better than before you push play. Before you go anywhere, please leave a comment down below. Some of your key reflections, your key takeaways. I love hearing from you and what this conversation has inspired in you. Let me know what you're going to do as a result of this conversation. I will be back next Wednesday where I will share another inspiring guest. To make sure that you don't miss that, please do subscribe, hit the bell and you will be notified as soon as it goes live. If you're curious to know how I, through Always Better Than Yesterday, can serve you, your team, your organisation, please do visit alwaysbetterthanyesterday.com and it will be my honour and privilege to help you in any way I can. Keep leading my friends. I've been Ryan Hartley, host of the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast here on YouTube. Always love.